If, as humans, we situate ourselves on the animal cladogram, this tree of life, to see where our last common ancestor with other living animals was, we would go back to a creature that would become known as Lophotrochozoa. Now, instead of taking the branch to the Lophotrochozoa, we're going to take this branch over here to the Ectizozoa. That word, Ectizozoa, means the animals that undergo an ectysis which is a biological term for the shedding of one's exoskeleton. So the most defining feature of this group of the ectizozoa is they all live in some kind of exoskeleton. An exoskeleton that is secreted by the epidermis to the outside, and the animals live in that protective shell. As usual in the animal kingdom, there's a trade-off that comes with that benefit. In order to grow or to undergo any developmental changes, animals that have that protective shell, like this cicada, will have to shed their exoskeleton before they can get bigger or change their body plan. And that's the nature of this term, ectizozoa, which means animals that undergo an ectysis, or the shedding of their exoskeleton. And that is no small challenge. And yet, despite this, arthropods have become the most successful animal group. They have around one million species, which really eclipses the number of all other animals in terms of biodiversity. They've evolved important ecological interactions with just about every organism in every ecosystem on the planet. There are many reasons why arthropods have become more successful than any other animal groups combined. The first and foremost reason is basically this exoskeleton that they have. The rigid external shell that they live in is very protective and it is key to their success in ensuring their survival in the face of many environmental challenges. The shedding of one's external skin provides some of these arthropods with the opportunity to change their body plan, a process known as metamorphosis. And this metamorphosis contributes to arthropod success by allowing different life stages to occupy different ecological niches like this cicada that's emerging to its final adult stage with the ability to fly. This flexibility around body plan means that there can be more numbers of the same species occupying the same real estate, without the different life stages competing with one another for resources. The next key to arthropod success was the evolution of flight. Significantly, and unlike all other animals that have evolved flight, in the case of arthropods, this did not involve the loss of the use of other appendages. Consider the animals that have evolved powered flight. Birds, bats, and pterosaurs, those flying reptiles from the Mesozoic era, and insects. In the first of these three cases, the appendages used for flight are the forelimbs of those vertebrates, which reduced their ability to be used in any other way. This meant a sacrifice or a trade-off in the use of legs versus wings. This is not true for insects, who have maintained the presence of their legs over evolutionary time and grown wings secondarily, which means they have both wings and legs giving them much more mobility and a greater ability to exploit different niches in the environment as well. The last point of arthropod success that has contributed so much to their ecological dominance is related to their extremely high reproductive potential, in the sense that individual female arthropods generally have a very high fecundity that is, a high potential to produce many, many offspring. And of course, the generation times are short in these short-lived organisms, meaning that they reproduce rapidly, in great numbers, and they can do so very frequently. So there is this high reproductive potential, seen dramatically here in this clip of locusts. This provides great adaptive potential during natural selection, because of the huge number of offspring that are subjected to various selective pressures, 
and the consequential possibility for adaptations to evolve within those offspring, given the genetic variability that would be among them. Now, there are also ecological consequences to this great arthropod success, in the sense that arthropods are found almost everywhere on the entire planet, in all freshwater habitat types, and terrestrial as well. They are also the most numerous kind of animal in terms of the number of individuals. For example, if we think of an ant colony, there can be thousands or even millions of individuals. Other types of impacts on the ecological processes are the many symbiotic relationships that insects have formed, particularly with plants over evolutionary time. We're talking specifically about examples like pollination services, seed dispersal, and the protection of plants against their natural herbivore enemies. This last example is another role that is often played by ants, who are highly territorial and will defend their plant resources against any insects or other animals that would like to feed upon them. Lastly, insects are so numerous, diverse, and abundant that they are almost integral to many aspects of ecosystem functioning. In the ecosystem roles that they play, via plant reproduction and pollination, for example, nutrient cycling via the food chain, or in the decomposition cycle. The importance of insects and arthropods in general to ecosystem functioning cannot be overstated. And of course, that implies that any loss of biodiversity due to human activities that affect arthropod populations would be threats to our own survival and general environmental sustainability. So where do arthropods come from? From where did they evolve? The origin of arthropods was very likely to be an adaptation from a body form which would have been very similar to something like an annelid worm as a common ancestor, meaning a long, segmented, worm-like organism that has various appendages coming off the sides of each segment. Very similar to what modern marine worms look like in polychaetes, for example, and of course, in some modern arthropods. There are some that do resemble this body plan more or less, with a head, a series of segments along the body, and appendages that come out very much like the centipedes and millipedes, which did more or less retain this more ancestral form. Higher arthropods, however, do not retain this purely segmented body form and undergo a second developmental process known as tagmatization. This is a process in which the various segmented or metameric units are fused into body regions in order to form functional groups. So the most common arthropods body plan that you may know already is one with a head region, a thorax, and an abdomen. But these are fusions of series of segmented body units into functional regions that perform certain roles. Generally speaking, the head is a sensory gathering region, responsible for receiving and processing of sensory information, as well as food intake. The thorax is generally the locomotor engine of the body, engaging in walking and or flying, and that the abdomen is more of the physiological section, where there is digestion, excretion, and reproduction. So the evolutionary origin of arthropods is one in which the metamerism, or segmentation, is fused into body regions, most notably into head, thorax, and abdomen, which is the main body plan for arthropods after the centipedes and the millipedes. The main characteristic of arthropods is the exoskeleton, made up of a hard substance that is secreted to the exterior of the epidermis and mostly composed of chitin, a polysaccharide, or carbohydrate molecule, that is very hard, impermeable to water and gases, and highly protective. Because arthropods are enclosed in this protective and tight shell, it restricts their growth and development, and therefore it needs to be replaced every time there is such growth or development. 
The process of molting or shedding the exoskeleton undertakes several steps involving removing the old exoskeleton, reabsorbing some of the substances that were embedded or invested into that old exoskeleton, growing the new one underneath, shedding the old one, and then increasing the body in size and hardening the new exoskeleton. This process is very costly in terms of time and energy. It also leaves the animal susceptible to danger. The production and replacement of an exoskeleton is very high in terms of energy and nutrient demands. One of the ways that arthropods can minimize this energy and nutrient loss from the shedding of the exoskeleton is to reabsorb some of the old exoskeleton before it is shed, thereby reclaiming some of those nutrients that would otherwise be wasted. The next limitation or challenge associated with ecdysis is the brief period of time after the shedding of the old exoskeleton and before the hardening of the new one. Let's pretend this banana is an arthropod and the skin is the old exoskeleton. When the exoskeleton is shed, the arthropod is highly susceptible to damage from environmental effects such as from chemicals like acids on the body surface, from pressures such as being stepped on, crushed by a rock, or from predation pressures, of course, by another animal looking to eat them. Mmm. Yum. Because shedding the exoskeleton leaves the creature so vulnerable, it's a process that is undertaken only when necessary, and only at specific times in the arthropod's life cycle. Looking at some specific arthropods, the next large group is that of the chelicera, which encompasses spiders, mites, ticks, and scorpions. By the way, don't try this at home. Of these, spiders are the best known group. There are about 50,000 species in the class Arachnida. Spiders are predatory animals that are not very active. They typically catch their prey using luring and trapping devices in the form of spider webs. The spiders spin their webs with spinnerets that release silk that is strong and sticky. In many instances, they also reflect ultraviolet wavelength patterns of light that will be attractive to certain other arthropods that will then get caught in the web and become the spider's next meal. The name Chelicera for this group of arthropods stems from the pincers or fangs that are located around the mouth and that inject venom into the prey. The spiders use their Chelicera fangs to bite their prey, which is usually another arthropod. Then they inject venom that will liquefy the muscles and the organs. After that, the spider will slurp up that liquid pre-digested slop to be distributed throughout their own body for digestion. This is a unique mode of feeding in spiders, wherein they pre-digest their prey outside of the body before aspiring that pre-digested liquid. For this reason, given that the spiders will generally only be feeding upon a pre-digested liquid diet, we find very few adaptations in spider digestive tracts process or mechanically break down food items, given the high degree of digestion that's already taken place in the exoskeleton of their prey. So what we see in the spider's digestive tract is really just a series of ramifications or folds and lobes that allow this liquid diet to be distributed to various parts of the body and for high surface area so that the liquid food items can diffuse through into the body tissues for absorption and further intracellular digestion in order to feed the animal. The next group of arthropods are the crustacea. There are about 70,000 different species. We're talking here about lobsters and crabs, and crayfish and the like. Their body tagma is similarly a head, thorax and abdomen region but the head and thorax are somewhat fused into one indistinguishable unit 
that is generally called a cephalothorax. These crustacea are largely marine organisms, and they typically will be filter feeders, using their many, many appendages to grab, capture, and pull food items towards their mouth. Then use the many, many appendages around their mouth to manipulate, to taste, smell, and to process that food as it goes in. The largest and most diverse group of arthropods are the insects. Class Insecta has approximately 850,000 species. That's more than half of all known animal species, making this class of arthropods the most diverse group of all animals. Most of us will recognize the typical insect body form of head, thorax, and abdomen, where the head has large eyes, antenna, mouth parts, the thorax has three pairs of legs and two pairs of wings, and the abdomen is segmented with the physiological, digestive, and other organs on the inside. As I mentioned earlier, arthropods have a molting process when they grow. But insects have gone a step further and taken advantage of the molting process to not only grow, but to change the structure of their body format while they're at it. This is a process known as metamorphosis, where at different life stages in the life cycle, there can be dramatic changes between juvenile and adult life forms, for example. The main life stages for a complete metamorphosis in insects, such as in the case of the monarch butterfly, would be eggs, larva, pupa, and adult, which you can see emerging from the pupa here. Generally speaking, the juvenile larva entail the feeding life stages. The pupa is the transformation life stage and the adult would be the reproductive life stage, although they're not limited to only those activities during each of these life stages. However, one of the consequences of having juvenile and adults undertake completely different ecological roles is that there could be many, many more individuals of each species without the juveniles and adults competing with one another for resources thereby creating another factor to their overall ecological success. Generally speaking, the definition of an adult animal is one that is sexually mature. And in insects, not only is it sexually mature, but that is the time at which the organism will grow its wings, which allow it to be more mobile, engaging in dispersal to be able to seek out sexual partners. But the evolution of flight in insects is a curious story in and of itself, as we'd mentioned, because unlike other types of animals, it did not involve the loss of any locomotory appendages. So of course flight is a very important feature for insects. And the first mechanism of flight was one in which the flight muscles are attached directly to the wings, and muscular contractions would cause those wings to go up and down thus being a very powerful and effective form of flight. But higher insects have evolved an even more adaptive mechanism in which the muscles are not directly attached to the wings anymore, but rather to the thoracic cage itself. This allows the wings to move via hinge mechanisms that are forced up and down through the deformation of the thorax. And one of the important consequences of this indirect flight muscular system is that it can get more wing beats per muscular contraction because of the resonance mechanism that's induced in the vibration of that thoracic cage, causing the wings to beat at a much higher frequency than the muscles are contracting. Therefore, it makes this a much more energetically efficient mode of transportation and offsets some of the challenges associated with flight being already a very energetically expensive mode of locomotion. It is also why, if we were to listen to the wing beat frequency of some higher insects, such as flies for example, so named after their incredible ability to fly, we will note that the wing beat frequency is much higher due to this indirect flight mechanism. 
So, for example, if you were to take the flying wing frequency of more primitive yet powerful flyers like dragonflies, it would be a low frequency and something that would sound like <laughs> as they're flying around. Whereas if you were to catch a fly and keep it in your hand, maybe something that we've already all done, and hear it trying to escape from that little chamber, we will know that the frequency of those wings is very high sounding, much more like And that's an indication of the speed at which their wings are flapping as a function of this highly adaptive flight mechanism. Now, because these animals are quite active, their nervous system must match it in order to be able to provide sensory input as well as control mechanisms to govern these levels of activity. Insects have a ventral nerve cord that runs along the entire length of the body with a mini brain up in the head and ganglia associated with important activities like seeing, feeding, and moving the locomotory appendages. But there are also ganglia in each of the segments, allowing a certain amount of independent control of segments along the way. In terms of sensory input, insects have a great deal of highly developed senses. First and foremost, their vision. That sense is generally very well developed via the use of a compound eye, which is unique in the animal kingdom, in that it is made up of a series of lens units that are isolated from one another. Each delivers one pixel of vision to the entire picture that is being viewed by the insect animal. The greater the number of these units, which are known as omatidia, the higher the resolution of their vision. Insects, generally speaking, can see in color, and their color vision is trichromatic. Human vision is trichromatic as well, with red, green, and blue receptors. Insect vision lacks the red receptor, but they have an ultraviolet receptor instead. This gives insects the ability to see wavelength reflectance patterns in the ultraviolet spectrum for which there are certain forms of communication in nature that use this frequency. For example, like this flower, Potentilla reptans, which to us looks like this, bright yellow, monochromatic. But to the insect, with an ability to see in the ultraviolet light spectrum, it looks like this. As you can see, there is a distinct pattern on it now. Flowers that are looking to attract pollinators to the plant in order to transfer pollen from one flower to the other often use reflection patterns in ultraviolet light in order to tailor their attraction messages to the insects who can see this light. This despite the fact that we humans tend to think that these flowers have been put here for us to smell and to appreciate our loved ones on Valentine's Day or the Day of the Dead, depending on your preferences. Though, who knows, that too may be the flower's way of manipulating us humans into helping propagate it. Nonetheless, flowers evolved to attract insects to plants, and so understandably they use cues that are relevant to the insect sensory systems. Other important senses for insects are sound production and sound reception, or both. Possible mechanisms include tympanic membranes in certain areas of their bodies, be it on a limb of a leg or on the side of the abdomen or thorax. A tympanic membrane is essentially a vibrating membrane, very much like what we have in a speaker cone. When we're listening to music on our computer or stereo, or headphones, the sound is produced by a speaker cone like this one. It vibrates at certain frequencies to receive signals and reproduce those sounds. The mechanism is used by cicadas, making a loud cacophony in the trees during late summer. Like these cicadas in the countryside. Another mechanism of sound production is in stridulations, 
used by animals like crickets. Where there will be a rough surface known as a comb and then a spiky surface known as a scraper. And the scraper scrapes against the comb and makes that cricket stridulation sound that we associate with summer nights. These sounds are important for communication in many insects, such as the cicadas and crickets, whose males use the sounds to court potential mates and to attract them for reproduction. Therefore, both production and reception of those sounds is important for the survival of those species. Another mechanism for sensory reception that is also useful in communication is that of chemosensory detection, olfaction, or gustation, meaning essentially the ability to smell and taste. Most specifically in insects, the sense of olfaction is highly developed via nerve dendrite receptors that open to pores in sensory structures such as antenna. They may have taste receptors on the surface of their mouth parts, like mandibles and maxilla, and these taste receptors are useful in order to detect molecules that are on the surface of a substance prior to eating it. The olfactory receptors are those that are meant to detect molecules that are in suspension in the environment. For this reason, the antenna and this chemosensory receptor mechanism are very important in insects for various forms of communication, particularly in sexual communication via pheromones, which are essentially communication chemicals that are used within a species. In insects, sexual communication generally occurs when females release a sex pheromone in order to attract males to the location of that female, at which point the male will attempt to court the female using his own sexual pheromones. If all goes well, as it did for these two beetles, that will lead to copulation and sexual reproduction of the next generation. Of course, there are many other pheromones that are useful in insect communication, including alarm pheromones that may raise a warning bell and alert others of danger. There are also trail pheromones, used by ants, for example, to be able to follow one another across the surface, and so on and so forth. Once reproduction has occurred, generally speaking, insects are not well known for undertaking any form of parental care. The most important behavior that parent insects undertake in order to ensure success for their offspring is a careful positioning of the eggs when it's time to lay them. So, in many insects, the females have evolved specific egg-laying organs known as ovipositors, which are specialized in order to lay eggs in very particular locations. Usually those locations are associated with the offspring's food requirements, like this leaf, so that when they emerge from the eggs, they'll be ready to eat and be off to a good start in life. In some instances, these ovipositors are modified into long syringe-like structures where they can lay eggs into the bodies of other insects. This is just such a case with these parasitoid Cotesia glomerata wasps inserting their eggs into these unfortunate Pieris brassicae caterpillars, which will now become unwilling hosts to the next generation of wasps destined to hatch inside them and eat their way out, ensuring that they have a good source of their nutrition in their first meal, getting them off to a good start in life. At the expense of the caterpillars, of course. If we were to note that insects and all other arthropods are enclosed in an impermeable hard shell, we would recognize that one of the important challenges of this is related to the diffusion of gases between the organism and its environment. In particular, getting access to oxygen for cellular respiration would be difficult. In order to solve this challenge, insects have a series of small holes in the side of their carapace known as spiracles, which let air diffuse directly into tubes inside the body. 
These tubes are known as trachea and will distribute the air directly to the tissues, muscles, and organs, rather than being diffused into a circulatory fluid such as blood, which is common for almost all other animals. So the gas exchange mechanism in insects is highly modified and very different from most other animals as a consequence of living in these impermeable shells. Many insects have evolved a high degree of sociality. This means that they live in large groups of related individuals, such as those that are found in the social hymenoptera, the order of insects that includes bees, wasps, and ants. We find that many of these insects live in colonies of family units founded by a queen and made up largely by her offspring. And they will all work together for the benefit of the greater family unit, such as these ants all pitching in to transport a dead gecko back to the colony. And of course we can imagine how this would lead to important levels of success for those family units that are working together rather than everyone for themselves. One of the coevolutions that's associated with the social insects is the pollination process. It emerged in the Mesozoic era, during the age of dinosaurs, when plants started producing attractants to their flowers. These were of keen nutritional interest to insects, so they would make a habit of visiting these flowers faithfully. As a consequence, pollen would be transferred from one flower to another much more efficiently than if the plant were just to send the pollen into the air and hope that some of it lands on a conspecific flower. The insect's taxiing of pollen from one flower to another involves much less waste and much more specific directionality of targeting of the same species of flowers. So, as a consequence, there were evolutionary adaptations over time for plants to favor insects that would come and visit their flowers by providing rewards for them, such as protein-rich pollen and sugar and amino acid-rich nectar. This is important food for pollinating insects and the reason that they visit the flowers. So over time it has ended up becoming a symbiotic relationship meaning that both the plants and the insects benefit from the association with one another. It also means that many flowering plants nowadays have an obligate relationship with pollinating insects to affect their sexual reproduction. They are no longer able to do it on their own. There are a number of consequences to this that are important to consider with respect to human society. For example, the production of food, which is largely dependent on pollinating insects to produce the development of fruit, nuts, seeds, and vegetables from those flowers that got pollinated. Additionally, our food production systems are increasingly reliant on fewer and fewer pollinating species, as we tend to prefer artificially managing species like honeybees and bumblebees because of the ease of rearing and the ease of transport. But this has led to a serious challenge for natural pollination levels. Over the last 50 or so years, there's been a dramatic decline in the numbers of all insects, generally speaking, across the board, not just pollinators. And it is largely for the same reason, human activity. Native pollinator populations have been in decline due to effects from agriculture, such as competition for floral resources from managed exotic honeybees, the loss of habitat from urbanization, and widespread use of toxic chemicals such as pesticides. Given the ubiquitous nature of arthropods and the critical roles that they play in ecosystem functioning, we really should be concerned about the loss of arthropod biodiversity. Not just for the general functioning of ecosystems, but from the perspective of enlightened self-interest for our own survival. <laughs>